Welcome back to another video, everybody. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about what's called free grace theology and why I believe that this can be a very, very damaging theology and ultimately the, the main problems with it. So for those who don't know, uh, free grace theology, um, it's sometimes called hyper grace theology. And I, I really don't like the term hyper grace to describe it because it makes it sound like it's possible to be too amped up about the grace of God. And I just, I mean, sure, hyper grace might be what some people like to label it, but to me it just doesn't communicate what I think needs to be communicated. There's, there's, there's never, <laughs> you can never be too amped up about God's grace. And so if we're going to actually critique it, I think free grace is a much better term to use. Um, so just getting that out of the way, I'll be referring it, um, here forth as, as free grace theology. And the idea behind free grace is that there is a, there is a massive distinction place between justification and sanctification to a point where the two do not go hand in hand like traditional reformed Protestantism has always understood it. And so in the Roman Catholic Church, Justification and sanctification are really seen as two sides of the same coin. You're justified, and as you're sanctified, you're also increasing your justification. If you fail in your sanctification, you lose your justification, those kind of things. And so they're so intimately tied together that there's really not a distinction in terms of the language used. Now, in Protestantism, traditionally, justification and sanctification are still seen as two sides of the same coin, but their role is different, and the way they relate to one another is not seen as, as, as the same basis or grounds. Let's put it that way. So in a Protestant understanding, the grounds of our justification is the finished work of Jesus Christ, his righteousness imputed to us, and that is our standing. Our standing is by faith alone, sola fide, in the finished work of Christ. That's, that's our justification, done deal. Traditional Protestantism understands it that way. Whereas sanctification is seen as the process in which we are working out the salvation that has been worked into us. And in the case of sanctification, though it is a necessary fruit of our justification, it in no way, shape, or form affects the basis of our justification. And so the distinction here between free grace and traditional Protestant theology is very important. In Protestant theology, while sanctification is not the basis for our standing before God, if there is no fruit in the Christian life, it demonstrates that the faith that we professed was also a false faith. As, as James says, faith without works is dead. And so the idea is that a faith that works is a living faith. Now, the works are not our basis for, our, for the standing we have before God, that is Christ alone, but the, the works act as a reflection or as evidence of the genuineness of faith. Now, in free grace theology, they would agree that the works that we do are merely the fruit of our faith. They are not the basis of or the, the, and they are not the standard by which God measures our rightness before him. However, they take it a step further to say that ultimately the two things are so detached from one another that sanctification is purely concerned with rewards and are the rewards we will receive on Judgment Day. It has nothing to do whatsoever with our standing with God, so therefore somebody could have a true, genuine, saving faith, live a life of licentiousness and sin, and still enter the kingdom of heaven based solely on their declaration of faith on Christ, not on their sanctification. And the problem with this is that this inevitably leads to an antinomian ideology that, that just becomes very rampant within these free grace movements. And they will say, listen, we're not encouraging people to sin. Sin is a horrible thing. It's damaging. But sin does not have eternal consequences. And I, I'm quoting, I'm, I'm actually quoting a free grace pastor when I say that. He has said, sin does not have eternal consequences. It only has temporal consequences in relationship to the rewards judgment. And so, 
Most free grace people are also dispensationalists. And because they're dispensationalists, they see two different judgments. There's a rewards judgment, at which they call the Bema Seat of Christ, where a man is judged based on his works, what has been done in the body, whether good or bad. And they would say that that judgment is determining the rewards that we will get, not determining, determining our salvation or our eternal security. They would say, on the other hand, the great white throne judgment is for unbelievers only. Believers will not be present because that is determining salvation. And since we're secure, we won't have to participate in that judgment at all. And so because they see these two different judgments with two different relationships, one is eternal, uh, the eternal judgment. And if we profess faith in Christ, that's a done deal. We're sealed, we're saved, it's over. Now, if we fail to live a Christian life, if we live in sin, we're going to screw ourselves up in terms of rewards, but our eternal salvation is secure. Now, here's the problem with that. Nowhere in Scripture do we ever see a distinction between what we do and the faith. And uh, maybe a good way to say this, I'm going to go back and rephrase it. A good way to say it is that nowhere in Scripture do we see that the vertical relationship that we have does not automatically and necessarily produce the horizontal Christian life that we have. Nowhere in Scripture are the two things disconnected. They're different. There needs to be a distinction between the vertical and the horizontal. But they're connected like an L. You can't chop off this part and have the other part stand up by itself. They both need each other. They both are essential to the Christian life. And they both concern eternal salvation. If you do not have fruit of your Christian life, if you do not have the works of God in your life, then you do not have a true faith in Christ. And here's why this is so important. If we read Paul in Ephesians 2, Paul says this. He says, by grace we were saved through faith. So the first part, we're saved by grace, purely the grace of God. Again, why I don't like hyper grace, because it's just the grace of God. It's only the grace of God. So you can't have too much grace. So we're saved by grace through the conduit of faith. And that not of yourselves, referencing both faith and grace. They're both a result of the gift of salvation. God's extension of salvation to us enables us to have faith. Without it, we wouldn't. That not of yourselves, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. So there Paul speaks of the vertical, right? By grace through faith we're saved not of ourselves, not of works, so that no man may boast. That's the vertical. But then he says, but you are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay, so now we're starting to get into the horizontal. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, is this just up to us? We just got to muster effort through the, these works that we were created for? No, no, no. These are works that Paul says God prepared beforehand that you might walk in them. So we see this dichotomy. You're not saved by your works, but you're saved unto good works. And it's God who's working them. Paul tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians. Work it out with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will what he wants for his good pleasure and purposes. So we have these, okay, so I'm working out my salvation, but God's working out my salvation. Okay, so I'm not saved by my works, but my works are what I was created for that God prepared for me. You see, Scripture ties these things so closely together. They dis it distinguishes them, but it ties them together. If you profess faith, but you have no works, you're not a Christian. If you have works, but you have no faith, you are not a Christian. The, it's a marriage. As James says, Faith is completed by works. In other words, you have an incomplete faith without works. Faith on its own is useless. If it has not love, it is nothing. Paul says that everything, if it has not love, it is nothing. So faith is always working through love. That is what makes it a genuine saving faith. You can't have a faith without love, without charity, 
bringing forth and producing the works of God in you. And so when free grace makes a distinction between these two things in such a, uh, in such a divisive way, in the same way they do with Israel and the church, you all of a sudden have a life that is secure in Christ and a life that you can sin. And those two things don't go together. You cannot have Christ move in with his spirit to dwell in you as a temple, as a holy, holy place, and expect to live as though it's a defiled place and expect that those two things can be compatible. And and that one is only affecting how many rewards you're going to get, as though the Bible even talks about rewards and quantity. So I'm concerned about this theology because I do see it very prevalent, especially in dispensational circles, and I think that it goes hand in hand. If you're going to accept dispensationalism, you better well accept free grace theology. And what worries me about it is it poisons the idea that there is any sort of role that we play in our salvation. And I know the monergists don't like to hear the idea of synergy, But the truth of the matter is, all throughout Scripture, we read about synergy. Paul even explicitly uses the Greek equivalent to synergy to describe our, us as fellow workmen with God, synergists with God. And so you can't get around that language explicitly, but you also can't get around it implicitly. All throughout Scripture, we're told, repent, believe, walk by the Spirit, do this, don't do that. And these things are not so that we can have a right standing with God, but that so we can live in accordance with that right standing with God. And if we don't live in accordance, we don't have a right standing with God. And so these things are married together. They're merged together, two sides of the same coin. And we need both works and faith together. We can understand and we can just differentiate and distinguish the basis versus the fruit. But we need to understand that we can never divorce them as though they are totally separate things, totally focused on two different things. The moment that we do that, we allow people to live in a life of sin without a saving faith, without true repentance. And we teach them that it's okay because God is not concerned about your sin. It only will affect temporal realities. But in terms of your eternal eternal security... What you do has nothing to do with that. And unfortunately, that is a lie. What we do does affect that because if we're not showing fruit, it's evidence that God himself is not working in us and that we have been hardened to him. You see, the works that we do do not show that we're doing our best and working really, really hard. The works that we do show that God's spirit is present in us. So when people say that works are necessary to salvation, I don't want anybody to hear them saying, your effort is necessary for salvation. That's not what's being said. What's being said is that works are necessary because it evidences the fact that God is doing something in you. It's all pointing and emphasizing God. If we're living a life of sin, God is absent. That is what it shows. It doesn't show that we're not working hard enough. It shows God's absent. If we're living a life of good, righteous deeds, the faithful works of the saints, it shows God is present, not that we're working really, really hard to save ourselves. So we need to understand those distinctions, and once we do and understand that the works we do are only the works of God in us being worked out as he works in us, We can understand the necessity for them and why it would be so foolish to say that God's free grace affords us a free ticket to heaven and the ability, not that they encourage it, but the ability to live however you want with only temporal judgment. I think it's very important to address this. And I think that, too, I just briefly touch on this. I don't want this to go too long, but exegetically, too, it's just not a sustainable view they they tend to go to texts that they don't really go into the greek they really just try to brush over and and read like one of them is whoever believes in me has eternal life i think it's john 5 that says that whoever believes in me has eternal life um and they would say look whoever believes it doesn't say anything about enduring persevering it doesn't say anything about that it just says believes um but again the word there is in the present active 
tense. And so it's the idea of the one who believed and is believing and continues to believe until the very end. And so we need to be very careful with any sort of one and done type ideas of salvation. The Bible references salvation as a process. And I think that when we recognize this process is led and guided by the Holy Spirit, it becomes less daunting because it's not about us. It's not about what we do or how, how well we work. It's about cooperating with the grace of God to allow him to continue to work and do what he wants in us because he has promised that whoever starts a good work in us will bring it to completion. So that is where our faith, our hope, our trust is. But we need not say that works don't have anything to do with our salvation and therefore give ourselves the ability to view what we do as separate from who we are. And with that, I'll leave you guys, and I, I thank you for watching. I pray you would consider the things I have to say and make it known to the people you come in contact with. Free Grace is a view out there that's perpetuated mostly by dispensationalists, but you'll find it in other places as well. So warn people um, and tell them, preach the good news to them, and, and show them that the gospel is really, really sweet and beautiful because not only does it promise to vertically make us right with God, but it also tells us that it will conform us into the image of Christ himself as a partaker of the divine nature.